to transition from clickers as a way to make PowerPoint lectures more interactive to a different use of PowerPoint as a method for creating short screen videos. Our next presenter is Lisa Mitchell. Lisa teaches in the South Asia Studies Department. She's an anthropologist and a historian of Southern India. She will share her experiences with an innovative project that she designed last fall to help the students in a large class she taught to work effectively in groups, explore new technologies, and learn collaboratively. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Anu. The first thing I want to say is I'm not a technophile. I don't have a smartphone. I still keep my date, date planner on paper. Um, and I'm here to tell you that if I can use technology in my classroom, you can too. <laughs> um, and part of the reason I've been able to do this is because of the great folks over at Weigel. And Anu and, and the staff over there have worked with me. They've worked with my TAs. Um, they've set up uh, tutorials, both for my TAs as well as for students, and they've helped students along with this process. Um, I want to do a couple of things. I want to um, give you an example of an assignment. And if you look in your blue folder, there is something that's headed uh, SAST 063 East and West, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Cultural History of the Modern World, which is the course that I piloted this exercise in. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the assignment. I want to show you very quickly two excerpts from two different student-produced voiceover PowerPoints. Uh, and then I want to talk about the things that I don't like about it or that make me nervous about the technology. And I'm going to end with what I like about it and why I'm continuing to use the technology in my classes. This is the third semester currently that I'm using them. Uh, if you just take a look at that handout that's in your folder, uh, this is what I give to the students. This is the one that I prepared for this semester. Uh, the course that I use this in, or that I piloted this in, and I now have, have, have extended it to a second course, they're both intro-level undergrad courses. This particular course is designed to attract students who might not otherwise be attracted to an area studies course. But the frame of the course is to teach students how to recognize and apply social science models to the study of the cultural history of the modern world. So uh, I use six commodities. And we look at, we, we look at uh, uh, spices, sugar, uh, cotton, tea, uh, heroin, or opium, and cocaine. And use those to look at models for thinking about cross-cultural interaction, the changing meanings associated with objects, and to kind of just expose them to an overview of the history of the modern world. So it's, it's kind of an ambitious course that has a lot of objectives. What I use this exercise for is to help them apply some of the analytic frameworks that I'm teaching in the course. And uh, I introduced this as a substitute for what I would have uh, otherwise done a, a five-page short paper, where they choose a commodity that we're not covering in the course, and they have to think about one of the processes, either related to production or consumption or the shifts in meaning as a commodity moves from one cultural context to a new cultural context. Uh, so uh, there's more on that assignment and how I set it up and how I evaluate it. Um, one of the things, and, and the first time I used it, uh, I had all the students in the class do it. it. So it was required of all the students. I gave them the option of either working individually or working in pairs. Um, subsequently, in part because most, most of the students were very positive, a few got anxious about the technology and got frustrated with some of the technical aspects. So it, subsequently, I've made it an option. They can either do a five-page paper or they can do the PowerPoint. I want to quickly show you a couple of examples. Uh, all right, the first one uh, is utilizing Jing soft, uh, software, which is a, a free software. It's a, a PowerPoint, or it's, a, it's actually a screen capture that cuts off at five minutes. So it limits the presentation to five minutes, which was what I wanted. I don't require students to use Jing, but that's, I, I make training available to them, uh, usually outside of class time. I usually set up two or three times that they can come in, um, get trained if they want. They can also just go to the Jing website and teach themselves how to use it. Some of the students have used other uh, short video uh, production. I don't provide training for those, but I, I don't limit it to Jing. They can use whatever they want. So the first one actually uses Jing, uh, and the commodity that the student is looking at is chocolate. And I'll just show you about a minute of this video. Uh, uh, see, I'm not a, there we go. <laughs> Sugary sweet greeting cards, a dozen red roses, and a candlelit dinner. Such are the physical niceties of Valentine's Day. Yet what makes the handwritten note so special, that bouquet of flowers so romantic? or that gourmet meal just so heartfelt. 
we will examine those questions for a classic Valentine's Day offering, chocolate, and see that this caffeinated confection owes its amorous symbolism to cultural beliefs. With its somewhat mythical status as an aphrodisiac, a product of its traditional Mesoamerican roots and historic European perceptions. Sophia Michael Cox traced chocolate's first human rendezvous with the Olmec people nearly three millennia ago. Successive Mesoamerican civilizations would use it for things ranging from burial to currency, but cocoa's most celebrated use remained as a beverage, especially for betrothal and marriage ceremonies. Marcy Norton states that the Maya interpretation of the words to serve chocolate denoted an invitation from one family to another to discuss marriage over drinks. And indeed, given liquid's chocolate's likeness to blood, Norton affirms that the beverage symbolized the blood flowing between intermarried families. Okay, if you're interested in watching the whole thing, uh, Anu's going to make it available on the Weigel site, uh, and I've taken permission from these students to use these in the, both in the presentation and to make them publicly available. Uh, the second one is a little more high-tech. Uh, the student actually included advertising video excerpts as well as voiceover PowerPoint. Um, the commodity is diamonds. Last longer than time. Love is one of them. A diamond is forever. Today, commercials like these are commonplace. Yet, in the 19th century, diamond rings were virtually unknown. How did a dramatic shift in demand for diamonds take place over such a short span of time? The answer, somewhat ironically, lies in those annoying commercials. By molding American rituals through advertising, the diamond industry has dramatically increased demand for diamonds, making them into an indispensable part of American culture. The huge spike in demand for diamonds in the United States began in the 1930s, soon after the Great Depression. Some argue that the Great Depression taught people the importance of holding tangible assets, of which diamonds were, and still are, one of the most precious. Another explanation is that new diamond mines had just been discovered in Africa, which led to a dramatic increase in supply and a decrease in the price of diamonds across the world. While this is most definitely true, economics can't fully explain the complete revolution of an American ritual. To get the full picture, we need to look at the political climate of the time and how advertisers were able to come in and take advantage of a tumultuous political atmosphere. Up until recent years, women secured their social standing through their marriages. Okay, Once a woman again, uh, the full system. videos will be available uh, on the Weigel site. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the things that make me, made me nervous about incorporating this into my class, um, and then ultimately what I liked about it. Uh, first of all, some of the students, when I, met, when I required it of all the students, some of them did find the technological aspects a bit frustrating, um, mainly in the uploading to the Blackboard site. And I think actually most of the problems were with Blackboard rather than with this technology. And so that's something that we're still kind of working on um, ironing out. Um, and ultimately, some students felt like they spent more time on that, on get, getting over those obstacles, than actually on the, the research and production. And I don't want them to feel that way, which is why subsequently I've made it voluntary. Um, the second thing that makes me nervous is that I already feel like writing skills are deteriorating among our students. <laughs> um, just in the short time I've been teaching, or well, the what, decade and a half I've been teaching, I guess. Um, however, um, so I, I, one of my initial anxieties was I wondered if I was giving them an option of getting out of, of a writing assignment. Um, but but I've, I've done a couple of things to compensate for that. One is that in this class I uh, incorporate two other primary source analysis exercises where they have to take a primary source and, and actually write a short paper. I also have them, I make available weekly journal questions and I require them to write answers to at least six of those uh, during the semester. So they are doing some writing. But the other thing, and, and this is something that I hadn't anticipated, they actually write out the transcript that they read. And, um, and then they read it aloud. And so, um, and because I make clear that this, this is going to be evaluated in exactly the same way that a paper is, in fact, I don't evaluate their use of technology. I only evaluate, you know, is there a clear thesis argument? Is the thesis supported with specific evidence and examples? Are peer-reviewed sources utilized and cited? Are the argument and its evidence well organized? And I find that, that because this is basically, it's a five minute video, which means it's two and a half double spaced 
pages. They have to be very concise, and uh, they're actually practicing all of the same skills that I would want them to be practicing in a writing assignment. Uh, OK, why do I like using voice over PowerPoints, and why am I continuing to use them? Uh, first of all, on the, on the whole, I'd say actually the quality of the argumentation and use of evidence is actually a lot better in the PowerPoint presentations than it is in the written paper. Not universally, but for the most part. Uh, they, they tend to be very well focused, very concise, and better illustrated. Uh, second, grading is actually easier and actually a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. I use the same, you'll see the rubric in that assignment, I use the same rubric. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I know that stack of papers will sit on my desk and I just don't want to go near it. Um, these, I, I want to I see them as soon as they get submitted. I want to watch them. I enjoy watching them. I usually watch them once over and then I'll go back and maybe watch it a second time while I'm making comments. And, and I, I use this little rubric so it's a kind of checkbox, um, which makes it fairly fast to grade. Um, three, I think it's more fun. Um, I introduce an element of competition into the class. Uh, each of the sections, this currently, when I piloted this last year, I had about 38 students, but now I have 100, about 100 students in four sections. Each of the sections, I require them to watch all of the videos. They don't read the papers that are submitted, but they watch all of the videos. And then they vote on the top three, and I screen the top video from each section in the lecture in the overall lecture. So they get that satisfaction of kind of competing with each other and also seeing other people apply the analytic frameworks that I'm teaching to particular commodities. So they're actually learning in a number of different ways. Um, and then, uh, and that just leads to my last point, because they're short, uh, students don't mind watching them, uh, usually in a section, a discussion section of 25. Um, if some of the students work in, I give them the option of either working individually or pairs, there might be no more than usually 10, because some of them will choose the, the written paper option. So they, they're watching maybe eight to 10 videos and then voting on those. Uh, and so they're learning, the, the, they're, they're being exposed to more commodities and more, an, more application of the analytic methods that I'm teaching. And for all of those reasons, I'm sticking with them. And this is the third class, the third semester that I'm using it, so thank you. So um, since we started a little bit late, I think we're going to go just a little longer on the faculty panel so that everybody continues to have their 10 minutes. Um, thank you. I, I actually just wanted to thank Lisa. I remember the first meeting when Lisa and I and her TA met, and it seemed just like this vague idea, and it's kind of amazing that it's become reality and there's student work to show for it.